start recording. So it's recording now. Um, all right, so um, the other thing is you know that uh, up in the POA folder, um, there's the option to put the revisions in there today. Um, go ahead and drop them today in the original bottle and ball folder. Um, but after today, um, if you want to turn in a revision, you can put it in the revisions folder, which should be under Dropbox, so that revisions folder there. Um, when I Basically what happens is whenever I go to grade um, any projects you turn in, once I'm done grading them, I go to the revisions folder. If you have another version of it there, I use that to overwrite the previous grade. And if you have anything in there from any of the previous projects, like let's say you turn in a revision from uh, project one, like the bridge, right? Um, then I will overwrite that grade as well. That way you can just continue to update your grade. If I've graded stuff out of the revisions folder, I drop it in, well, I don't have one in here yet. I will basically make a new folder called <coughs> graded, right? And so let's say um, Robert turns in a revision to the bridge project. After I update his grade, I'll put that, that project he put in there under the graded folder. And so if you go in there and that thing you turned in is under graded, then you'll know that I've graded that and, and the, the grade that's on D2L is the most up-to-date grade. Um, the reason I do it that way is because if he wants to keep revising it over and over and over again, he can until the end of the semester. Until the last day of class, you can turn in revisions to anything that you've already turned in once, right? Um, but for today, um, because I haven't gotten around to grading them, you're welcome to just go ahead and drop that in the, uh, um, where is it? Yeah, the ball in the bottle project. So, how many, you, how many of you like that project? All right, I, I'll take that. Yeah. That's, a, that's, a, that's a success. Yeah. It didn't suck. Um, how many of you didn't like that project? And that's all right, too. All right, so we got a couple. That's fine. Um, this is good information to be learning about yourself. So <laughs> I don't like 3D animation in general. Um, how many of you would kind of agree with that? How many of you are like being somewhat turned off by the 3D part of this class? Strong disagree. I like it. Strong disagree. <laughs> so some of you like the 3D part of the class. Um, how many of you um, like the keyframe part, like where you're making things move? Sorry. All right. Okay. How many of you like the modeling part? Yay. A couple of modeling people. What about lighting and rendering? Are they liking that stuff? Yeah. Huh? But that was also kind of fun. That was also fun. Um, so I, I ask you these questions because it's, it's stuff you need to be considering. Um, it is absolutely okay for you to take any of these classes, right, and just decide that is not for me. In fact, that is why these classes exist, right? Um, you take principles of visual effects and you're like, you know what? I'm not enjoying any of these things then you probably shouldn't major in visual effects, right? You probably should choose one of those other three concentrations. The whole point of this class is for you to figure out what it is you like and what it is you don't like so you can invest the last three years of your time here at ETSU on that, right? But a lot of times the, time, the reason you don't like it the first time through is because it was hard and it was difficult to figure out and, and you maybe weren't 100% happy with the result. So that's why we do four projects in this class. And my hope is that you'll get to try all of the things in um, animation or principles of animation a couple of times so you can say for sure, nope, I really don't like animation, or yep, I really like animation, right? Um, so uh, what we've gone through so far is the, you know, some basic modeling, texturing, lighting, and rendering in the bridge, right? But that one was a little light on the animation. Um, the bottle project um, was a little heavier on animation. We were, we were messing around in the graph editor. Um, we were learning how to key stuff. Um, we were learning about arcs and, and easing and stuff like that. Um, but a little lighter on the modeling. I tossed a couple of new modeling things at you. Um, I tossed a couple of new lighting and, and rendering things at you, but nothing, nothing like extremely difficult, right? 
Um, so what I'd like to do in this project is we're going to sort of pull away from the keyframe part of animation. We're going to work a little bit more on the modeling, lighting, and rendering part. And we're going to delve into effects animation. So effects is a completely separate track than like, it's not a separate track, you're still in animation concentration. But it's more, less about um, setting keyframes and more about simulating stuff with physics. Right? Um, so you may like that part of animation more, and, and we'll find that out. Uh, but before we do that, we, we just need some stuff to be animating. We need a world, right? And so this project is the breakfast project. We're gonna, what we're going to do today is we're going to go through a little bit more complex modeling. Um, we're going to model a coffee cup together. And, um, and possibly, if I have time, a cereal box. Um, actually, I'll probably show you the cereal box relatively quickly. Um, and then when you come back in next class period, um, what we're going to do is we're going to make some cereal, and we're going to make that cereal pour out of that cereal box right, into a bowl. Um, you're also going to model the rest of the scene, like you know, a couple of more objects for the scene, so give you a little bit more practice in modeling. And we're going to simulate a couple of other things as well. We're probably going to put some like steam or something like that coming out of your coffee cup. Um, and then that's pretty much going to be the, the entire um, project. I have a little bonus thing that I tag on there for like some extra credit. Because um, this is a pretty big project. In terms of like scope, this will be one of the biggest ones. Um, to give you an idea of the rest of the semester, we, we have probably a, a, about two and a half weeks we go on this one. I think we're, we're going to be done April 9th, I think it is, for this project. Um, and then we kick into our final project, which is um, modeling, rigging, and animating a two-legged creature, like a robot or some sort of, pretty much when, anything you want it to be. It, it just needs to be two legs, right? Um, and then that's the rest of the class, is these two projects we're doing. Somewhere in the middle of all of that, probably during one of the work days, um, I'm going to, um, I, I have it penciled in at a certain date, but it'll kind of depend on how much we are able to keep up with this pace. Um, we're going to have a day where we talk about midpoint review and some of the careers out there, some of the options out there for careers. Um, and so that's kind of the overview of what we're doing for the rest of this semester. Sound okay? Sure. Sure. All right. Uh, <laughs> um, it doesn't sound okay. I mean, but it's not like we can change it. Oh, no. But, I mean, I, I want you to be happy. <laughs> so, um, so let's, um, let's go ahead and start on the uh, modeling the coffee cup. Again, this is, this is how, um, however it works best for you. Um, but I feel like we're getting to the point right now that most of you are probably a little more comfortable in Maya. Is that a safe assumption? Yes. Sure. sure. <laughs> more comfortable than you were day one? Yes. yes. Right. Okay. Um, so um, I, I can't always tell if you're just deciding to watch or if you're lost. So if you need me to stop or slow down, slow me down, right? If you're wanting to completely walk through this with me, that's cool. If you're wanting to watch it later, that's cool. But I'm going to pick up the pace of my lectures just a touch, primarily because I'm giving you plenty of versions of these to watch at your own pace later, right? Um, or to, to keep up with at your own pace later. Um, so that way we'll be able to get through more stuff in class without it kind of dragging. Um, but at any point, if I do something and you're like, wait, 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 what did you do? Just raise your hand and say, could you do that again? Slow me down. Be like, hey, what's that for? Um, any interaction that you have, like, I, I am not going to be mad for you talking out in class. Like, just ask me. You don't even have to raise your hand. You can just be like, what was that? What? Like, just slow me down. Um, so, I'm going to model a coffee cup. What's the first thing I need? <laughs> I like, but you both know how I ask questions. Um, so we do need to set our project. Um, actually, I'm going to go ahead and create a project because I don't currently have one. Right? Um, I also, um, like, when I start to model this, what is something else I'm going to need for that? 
some form of reference for it, right? Like, we probably all think we know what a coffee cup looks like. Um, you're probably pretty close, but proportionally, I've seen some really ugly coffee cups come out of this class in the past. <clears throat> and all it really takes is just looking up some coffee cup images and being like, oh, it turns out the handle on a coffee cup is that thick, not this thick, right? Um, so let's go ahead and, and do those things. Um, first things first, um, I need I need this to be a project on its own. Um, I'm just going to go ahead and do that on my desktop. So I'm going to go to File, um, Project Window, and I'll hit New. Instead of Bottle, we're going to call this one Breakfast. Um, I'll give you the official write-up for this at the at the end of this because it kind of builds off of what we're doing today. So. Um, and so that's just going to put that on my desktop. For you, you probably want to put it somewhere where it's not going to get overwritten. So go ahead and hit accept. And that should mean now, yes, I have this breakfast folder on my desktop right there. Now, in the source images folder, I want to get me a image, right? So, some reference of a coffee cup. Now, you can use whatever you want, whatever kind you want. Um, but I'm just going to Google coffee cup and go to my images. Um, frankly, I like a gigantic coffee cup at home. Just scroll on down past that first one. Um, your call if you want to do more of a, a rounded, like, teacup shape. Um, I'm probably going to go more for, like, the mug, you know, um, mainly because it holds more coffee. I'm also wanting an example that's kind of from the side view. And right now, the one I'm seeing that's looking the closest is this thing right here, right in the middle. Um, for the purposes of this class, I would encourage you to get one with a handle, because that's really what this part of the lecture is focusing on, is how to make a more complicated, like, compound object, right? Um, so I'm going to go with that one. Let's go ahead and pull him down that so um, Google made this much more hard much more difficult to still images but not impossible if we right click on this and say open image and new tab it will create us a new tab here and then we can right click on that save image as did I get that save image as um, and on my desktop breakfast source images folder white coffee cup and go ahead and hit save Okay, so most of this is, yeah, there we go. So we got the white coffee cup. So most of this is pretty familiar to you all. Um, I'm also going to sort of refresh you again on how we're going to get our image reference in here so we can start modeling to this coffee cup. Um, I'm going to do this in my front view. So again, front Z there. Right. And once I'm in my front view, I'm going to click this button right there. So it's the one next to the little bookmark like thing. It's the image plane button. It's the fifth button over. And when I click that, again, in my orthographic front view, it's going to go look for an image for me to put in there. So I'm going to choose my white coffee cup. Open. And there we go. Yes. Oh, that last one I went to? Yeah, let me, let me do that one more time. So, um, it's along my viewport here, at, like while I'm in my front view, um, along the viewport here, there's these, there's these three cameras, these little three camera buttons. There's this little flag thing here. And then the fifth one there says image plane. It's like a flat plane with a blue plane coming up out of it. And if I click that, it should take me to the source images of my breakfast folder. And that's where I'd save my coffee cup image. Hit open. Okay, wait. I'm sorry, I was typing the picture. Okay, I'll do it one more time. So did you put that picture in your source images folder? Yep. Okay. So you see where um, we got these three cameras here? Mm. Then we got this image, or uh, this little flag. Oh, it has the little blue thing, right? Yep, and then the fifth one has that little blue thing there. So we click that. And then I just choose the images, or the image that we downloaded. Huh? Oh yeah, like here? View? 
image plane and then import image. Um, interestingly, you can also do this with video. Um, I don't, this isn't usually the method that I do with video, but it will work. Now, I'm going to take just a minute to try to line this thing up to where the center of it is, is kind of uh, along the, the center axis here. Because the center of my image, in terms of size, isn't always the center of the coffee cup, right? So one of the ways we can do this is we can use our grid. And we'll notice that like this cup on one side of the x-axis is one, two, three, four, almost five units, right? So if I go to the other side, one, two, three, four, almost five units. Um, so I'm, I'm about the right spot there. I can raise this up to where it's on the ground. And then I'm pretty much in the right spot. Now, if I go to my perspective view, though, you'll see that it's right there on my origin. And so if I created a sphere, a sphere is going to be right in the middle of that image. And so just to make it easy on myself, I usually move this back in the z-axis. Now, if I go to my front view, it doesn't, moving it in the z-axis doesn't actually change what it looks like here. It's still the same scale. Right? Okay. So we have our coffee cup in here as a reference. If I were going to, um, if I were going to, start modeling a coffee cup, which of the primitives would you use? A cylinder and a torus? Yeah. Okay. What if I told you I'm only going to use one object? Which one would you use? Use the torus? Yeah. Okay. So, even if it's not this, what if I told you, like, what if I told you there was an option to make it Without creating the cylinder or the torus, what would you use? Uh, use like the cone. Uh, the outline. Uh, outline. We did the second bottle in the last one. So uh, <laughs> where you where you drew that that yeah, thing and revolved it. Yeah. So so yeah, we could do that. We could do a plane. Um, I'll show you that um, if I go to create polygon primitives, there's also one in here that says pipe. Right, and so since our cup has that hole down in it, that's another option. I guess what I would try to say is there's not a right answer to this. There's only the way that you want to do this. And every one of them is going to have a slightly different result. And that's one of the things that is most important that you learn this semester, which is your job is not to repeat tasks. Okay, so think back to... Um, turn of the century, the Industrial Revolution, everything was booming. There were steel mills everywhere, and you went and applied for a job, and you said, hey, um, I want a job in this factory. And they're like, all right, come on over here. You're going to be using drill press number seven. And here's how you use drill press number seven. You press it, and then you pull it back. Now, do that until you retire or die. Go. And then they, <laughs> and then they walk away, right? That's how you would train somebody to repeat a process. Obviously, jobs were much more complicated than that, but that's what the assembly lines in a lot of factories were, right? You would repeat the same process over and over, and you, that was just your job. You would go in and you would do that as fast as you could to get as many of those processes made as you could, right? And unfortunately, those jobs are becoming less and less and less in the world nowadays. There are very few jobs where you can go and just repeat a process over and over and over again and make any type of money that you can live off of. Right? Now, if something is that easily automatable, they just automate it. Right? They, they create a machine that can do that and they invest $20,000 in that machine instead of $40,000 a year in a person. Right? Um, and that's a little bit disheartening. That means that those, those kinds of jobs that most people think of as a job aren't really around as much anymore. The vast majority of jobs that exist today and will exist in the future require you to solve a problem, right? Yeah, that's right. right. Well, so, yeah, and some of that might be. That's, that's another question longer, longer down the road. 
Um, that just means that the, the jobs that you the problems you're required to solve have to become more and more complicated and more um, necessary for creativity, right? That's why this like this department and the arts are very important, is because that's something that can't be automated. That requires creative thinking. Right? Um, and so in the future of this class and in your future here in digital media, there are very rarely ever situations that have one correct answer, right? Um, the answer is you used your imagination, your, your mind, to solve that problem in a creative and elegant way. Um, and I can model this same exact coffee cup no less than 10 different ways. I can, I can do all 10 of them and end up with almost the same exact coffee cup, right? I can start with a cylinder. I can start by tracing it out and doing the loft or uh, the revolve. I can start with the um, with the tube. Um, there's so many different ways in which we can create this, right? Um, and none of them are wrong. They all just leverage the skills that you find most intuitive, right? Um, so I'm going to show you the way I find it most intuitive. Um, but with an object like this, it's you know like maybe. Uh, the majority of you will probably end up agreeing with me by the time it's over with. When you go to model something really complicated, let's say, um, let's say Black and Decker invents a new type of drill. It's very ergonomic and fits the shape of your hand and has like all of these bevels and twists and everything on it. Well, there's no button that just automatically is the intuitively best, simplest way of going for that, right? Everybody's going to come to the same conclusion in a different manner. And that's why practice is important in this. That's why um, you will never get a job in this just from having some knowledge. You can't read a book and get good at this. The only way you get good at this is by screwing it up over and over and over and over again until you're really good at doing it. Right? Um, so I, I, I throw that out there because um, a lot of times I get questions that are like that. How, how should I model this cereal box? How should I model this fork? And there's not an answer to that. Like there's a, an infinite number of answers to that that would all result in beautiful forks. Um, I'm going to show you the way that I, like, that just kind of jumps out to me intuitively. What I would challenge you to do is if you get a little bit of free time over the next couple of days, try modeling this same coffee cup in a different way. Like, try to see if you can get a different path to, to modeling that coffee cup. The way that I usually would go about this is I look at the shape um, of the object and I say, which of my um, primitives are the closest to that shape already? Right. Um, so we got two options on that. We have the cylinder or the pipe. Right. Both of those are very cylindrical. One has a hole in the top of it. But that hole goes all the way through it. One has no hole in it at all. Okay, so that means neither of them are complete yet. Right? I I'm going to have to make a change to this. For me, it's easier to drill a hole down into that cylinder than it is to patch the hole that is in the pipe. Um, that's just that's just how I look at it. That doesn't mean that you would look at it the same way. I. If I have time, I'll show you both afterwards. But yes, there is there is a very pretty simple way of doing both. Um, so let's go ahead and go with the cylinder. Once I get the cylinder in here, I can start scaling this up, getting it kind of to the same proportions. Um, it's going to be a little taller. Right. So. There we go. We almost have a coffee cup. Um, now, we've talked about this a little bit um, in the past, too. If I hit three, what happens to this cylinder? It smooths it, right? And looks way less like a coffee cup. It looks like a Donkey Kong barrel now, right? Um, like, that's not necessarily what we want it to do. Why does it round off that much? Right. So, so it automatically forms into this one point. It's trying to guess. Yeah, it's trying to guess. And we've, we've inserted edges 
in there um, to give it parameters to guess at, about, right? And right now, this object is only one polygon tall. So it's trying to round that entire thing, and what we end up is with this like this pill shape, this capsule shape almost. Um, so that means if I were to go back here, go to my channel box, go down to this polycylinder one node, and add more height divisions, and then hit three, I get a slightly different solution, right? In fact, the more of these height divisions I add, the closer it starts to look like this rounded coffee cup, right? Um, so that's what some people have a tendency to do is they will create this and they'll just make a huge number of subdivisions, right? Um, but in terms of being efficient as a modeler, so many of those aren't necessary, right? If I, if I select this object, really the only ones that are necessary are those that are like close to the edge to get that rounded bevel on the corner there. So I'm going to do a fewer number of these. I'm not going to do none. Um, let's take these subdivision heights down to something more like, let's try, let me look at it from the front view and think about it. Um, let's try seven. Yeah, let's try seven, right? No, I'm sorry, let's try six. So with six, now it's a little too bubbly again, right? And so if I want this bottom section here to be sharper, what I can do is I can grab this edge and double click it and just move it closer to the bottom, right? So if I hit one, you'll see that I'm just moving it closer to that edge. I don't want to pass that edge up because then some crazy stuff starts happening down here, right? Um, but I, I can start to move it closer, and then when I hit three, I'm just sharpening that edge on the bottom, right? The same up here. If I if I move this closer to the top, I'm going to sharpen that edge on the top. Yes. Um, you just double click. You you select one edge, and then you double click it. Okay. Or yeah, if you just double click any of the edges, it'll do an entire edge loop. Now, it turns out that I think I was wrong. I think I really did need seven. But rather than go back, um, I'm going to just slide some of these around and show you a way of adding yet another one in there. So you probably are already familiar with this. Um, slide that up a little bit. Um, so I want to make sure that these are also going to line up with my coffee cup handles. So I can do something like this. I'm just going to kind of do this in the unsmoothed version. Put one at the top here. But I need one more here to line up with this. How do I get another edge in there? I think I've already taught you all this tool. Yeah, insert edge loop. So that's under mesh tools. Insert edge loop. And if I click on this, I can insert another one in there. And so now I have um, these, these two edge loops here um, are just going to exist so I can extrude out a handle later and connect those back in, right? So I'm kind of planning ahead. So that's the next step in modeling is, is that once you know a bunch of these tools, you can say, oh, I'm going to choose the cylinder because I know it's easy to extrude that hole down into it, and that's an easier tool for me to use than the, um, than the fill hole tool is to close up the bottom of the pipe. Yes? Okay. So okay. I use the nerves. How do I convert nerves to polygon? Um, okay. Uh, there is a way of doing it, depending on how far along you are. It may be easier just to recreate it with polygon. Oh, no, you're good. You're, you're, you're way up to this. Uh, so select the object. And then go to um, modify. Yes. 
choose the very last thing on the bottom of the list. Tesla. Yeah. So now you should have both. You should have a nerves and a polygon version right in front of you. Okay. <laughs> Bless you. Yes. Okay, so one of the questions we have back here, um, you all may see this sometime. If I just select one edge right now, Okay. 
Okay. So, um, one of the things we were seeing back here a minute ago um, is that if you just select one, I'm going to turn off my grid. It's kind of annoying. Do what? Yeah, well, so if you do that, if you accidentally put an extra edge in there that you didn't need, that's okay. We can get rid of that. Um, so let's say I did that. Let's say I inserted another edge loop. Right? And I didn't need that one. If I just hit W and select the entire thing, if I hit delete, that's actually a bad thing. Like if I just hit delete, it looks like it goes away, but you'll notice that it's still got that slice in there, right? Like there's still a vertex there where that edge was. Um, to actually get rid of that edge, you have to hit control delete, and it'll get rid of the, the edge entirely. So you can start reducing how many are in there as well. Um, earlier, somebody was having an issue over here of like, if you select an edge, right now it just shows that, that edge highlighted. But if you tap B, you'll see that it kind of gives you this like fall off range. And then you can move and like sort of <laughs> manipulate it like that. That's called soft select. You can turn that on and off by tapping B. And if you hold down B, you can sort of scale what part is selected. So... Right, so we don't really need that right now. Um, yes, oh, do you have more, another question? Huh? I actually don't have any on the cap. Um, you can put some in there, but I'll, I'll show you how to fix that here in a second. So, so let's say this is where we're at. Um, I know everybody's kind of in a different point um, in this. Currently, it's really hard to drink any liquid out of my cup, right? Because it's solid, right? That, it's not going to hold very much. So I'm going to select all of the triangles on the top. So I'm going to go to my face mode. Right? And so the patient way of doing this is just holding down shift and adding to your selection as you go around. Right? You can also drag select like this. Well, let me do this. If I drag select like this, I'm like, look, I got them all. But I also got those. All right, so you have to be a little careful about using that drag select. If I do this, and those are the only things I accidentally selected, if I hold control, I can deselect those, and now I still just have that cap selected. Right. You just make your cap zero. I can what now? Oh, yeah, it'll have like a, a hole in it, but the problem is, is then you wouldn't have any depth to it. Ooh, yeah. Try, try smoothing that and seeing how distorted that gets, though. Because then what you have is one polygon at the top that has tw uh, 20 sided or 20 edges around it. Yeah. Um, yes, does anybody have their hand up? Yeah. All right. I thought somebody had their hand up, uh, so I'm not sure. Um, okay. So with these triangles selected, um, I'm going to extrude these, right? Now, how we've been thinking about extruding, um, you all remember the, uh, like that Play-Doh toy? I guess they probably still have some variation of it. Like, you pack the Play-Doh in it, and you push that lever down, and it, like, poops out that worm shape, like that, like that weird, yeah, like, or, yeah. or maybe it's like a star or something like that. It right? looks like poop. Yeah, it does, right? Like, it's like, the, it was the Play-Doh poop machine. Um, the hair thing now? Yeah, so, like, they also had them with the hair, like, where it grew the hair out of the guy's head or whatever. That's, that's When we say the word extrude, that's really what we're talking about, right? That's extruding that material out. And so when I, when I say extrude, most people think I'm going to take that face 
and make it grow out. But really what I'm doing is I'm just creating more mesh that allows me to manipulate the object. Yes? Things are happening. Things are happening. So, so if I extruded this, it's just going to make it grow taller, right? Um, but that's only if I move it upward. Really, if I extrude it, um, what is happening is it's taking that face that I have, and it's duplicating that face and um, adding, like, a new face that connects those, right? So let me show you. If I were to scale this right now, right, it's going to do that. Um, if I extrude it, control E, it's going to create a new face in that same location. And now if I scale that face, it's just like I get to sort of pull in on that. Now I could also push up on that, or I could push down on it, or I can move over on it. I really just generated some more mesh. And that's what the extrude tool is best at, is creating additional mesh where there was, was no mesh before, right? Um, and so you kind of have to start thinking of it that way. So I'm going to grow new mesh out of that area. Now, in this case, um, it gets a little confusing because that new mesh that I'm going to grow, I'm going to push down into the cup, and it's going to seemingly reduce the amount of volume the cup is taking up, right? So um, if I hit Control-E again, if, if you don't like that shortcut, you can also do um, Edit Mesh and extrude is right there as well. Um, but I, I like control E and then I can move this downward and you'll start to see that even though I could extrude it up, I can extrude it down into the cup and it will allow me to make that that deeper, right? Now, in the process of doing that though, recognize that the inside of my cup is still just one face tall. Yes. When I scaled it in, let me go back. Right. All I did was I just hit Control E again to extrude down into it. So the way to think of extrude is, let's say I hit Control E. I'm in extrude mode, right? I can push it up. I can you know sort of move it around or wherever. Whenever I'm ready for more, I hit Control E again. Right? And so I can keep growing it like that. And what we can do then is we can just sort of grow that into whatever shape we want it to be, right? Um, that's all I did with the top of the coffee cup is make sure. Right, is I hit Control E, I hit R for to go to scale mode, that way I can scale it inward, right? And that allows me to get that that lip of the cup right there, right? And then I hit control E again, and using the arrow that's on the extrude tool, I just pushed it down into the cup, right? Now, in the process of doing this, though, you'll see that the inside of my cup is only one polygon tall, right? Um, and that means if I were to smooth this, we already saw what happens there. It really rounds it off, right? Um, so you'll notice that when I hit extrude, I get this little, this little thing here that pops up, right? This little, this little menu. And so we could use that to extrude that down in. That's actually probably what this, yeah, local thickness, trans, or local translate Z does. You'll also see that there's this offset value here. I can click on the word offset and make it bigger or smaller, right? But the other thing I can do is add divisions. Like from that extrusion... I can add additional divisions in there. And that means if I use that offset, I'll still have that same number of divisions. It's just allowing it to, um, to sort of taper, right? So I just went ahead and added four or five more divisions in there. If I hit W, now I pretty much have a coffee cup. If I hit three, I, I'm getting the shape 
that I'm wanting and it's kind of retaining that shape inside as well. Yes? Would there have been any downside to um, inserting adding more divisions but instead just doing another extrude? No, no, you can just extrude over and over again. Now here's the here's the thing you want to watch out for, and this is the thing that most people um, don't recognize, right? Um, I can grab, let's just grab another face here, right? Um, I can grab this face here, right? And I can hit Control E, right? And let's say I change my mind. I'm like, oh wait, never mind. I don't want to extrude. I'm just going to click off that. Well, my cup still kind of looks the same, right? Until I smooth it. So what it did is it duplicated that face and connected it, whether I wanted it to or not. Right? I hit Control E. I told it to. I don't have to move it to make it extrude. It extruded. It's just still taking up that same space it did before. Um, so you have to be careful. Whenever you're getting weird stuff like this in here, that means you extruded something accidentally or you extruded it and didn't move it. Right? So um, that's the only thing to really watch out for in those situations. Uh, that's where I extruded when I extruded the first time, and then I just scaled it inward. Right, but after you um, curved everything, and it's like the brown curve, it's a very faded off. Oh, smooth. Um, <coughs> I can show you some of the mechanisms I've done last night. So, one of the things you can do is just grab that little bit on the inside. Um, go to your edge with <laughs> Modeling is is taking the, this information we have and continuing to refine in the areas where we want more information, right? So let's say uh, um, if, if you if you want to get in there to like the really like detailed stuff, right? When this coffee cup was created, what probably happened is that there was a ceramic cup. They covered it in a food safe glaze, and then you fire that glaze, and that means on areas where it's uh, rounded, sometimes that glaze kind of puddles and gets thicker, right? And that's a detail that you really only know by looking at objects, right? By, like, you know, examining them. I, I know it because I used to work in a craft shop and I've, I've fired stuff in a, a kiln before. Um, but that lip looks a little too perfect, right? It looks a little too much like um, like it was made by a computer, right? Yeah, <laughs> So we can we can play around <laughs> we can play around with these shapes on this um, original uh, uh, level here, right? So I could go to um, 
mesh tools and insert edge loop and I could click and insert an edge loop around here right? and then sort of play around with that to maybe make it a little more round like this right I could maybe grab this lip and maybe scale it out a little bit to give that feeling of like the glaze kind of building up there right um, I could even add another lip on the inside here um, edit mesh insert edge loop right? something like this and I can scale that in toward the center to make it a little bit more thick, right? And now we're starting to look a little bit more like those, um, like those diner coffee cups, right? They're like really thick and they only hold like half a cup of coffee. And you're like, could you just keep refilling this over and over again, please? Um, and so like, however you're going for this, that's, that's what we're doing. We're manipulating these edges to build the volume or the form that we, we need, right? Um, the hard part about this, though, is how to manipulate these edges. <clears throat> so this next section, I will show you first the wrong way to make the handle. Okay, um, I'm going to go ahead and save mine really quick, uh, just so I have this. File, save scene as, cup. So what I see a lot is people doing this, going to the polygon modeling, they create a cylinder, or this, uh, I'm sorry, this torus. Uh, they scale that up. They rotate it. rotate it. They change the thickness of it like this. Right, e. um. right. Yay, we got a coffee cup handle. Um, what's, what's wrong with this? So, yeah, we do have that issue there, right? I mean, I could probably find a way of, like, taking all those spaces in there, but just looking at it from outside. The problem with this is, is it doesn't, like, that's not how real objects feel, right? Um, and, and it's, that's the that's, uh, problem-solving thing. I understand that very early on in modeling, you're just trying to get something, right? So, give me a second. I'm teaching. Um, so, <laughs> so, the problem with this right now is like how unnatural and unreal that edge looks, right? Like that just looks like what it is. I took two objects and I bashed them through each other in this make-believe world we're playing in, right? Um, in the real world, this would have all been fired with the same glaze, and it would have felt like it was all part of one continuous surface, right? And what we get there is this weird seam, like this weird crease, and that just feels like, oh, that's, that's not real there, right? Um, so the way I'm going to do this is I'm going to extrude my coffee cup handle out of the cup itself so it's all one continuous piece of mesh, okay? Think of that as like a human being, right? Someday you're going to model a human being or like the next project you're going to model some form of creature, right? And let's say that they're like Mike Wazowski, right, from, from Monsters, Inc., right? He was a sphere for a body. They didn't just shove two cylinders up in like into his like torso and be like, he's done, right? Like that, is, he's a contiguous bag of flesh, right? He's got a skin that goes all the way around that. And so that has to feel that way. My rule of thumb and the thing that people ask me a lot is, should this be one object or two objects? And the answer is, in the world that you're building this in, or in the real world, would that be one or two objects, right? Our, our, um, our my, my Snapple bottle that I refilled with water because I forgot my water bottle at home. Um, the, um, the bottle, the glass itself is one object. The lid is another object, so it's perfectly fine if you wanted to model those as two pieces, okay? Um, whereas, like, my fingers are not five different objects, and they're, they're connected to my hand. That means these fingers have to grow out of that model of my hand. My hand has to grow out of the model of my arm, right? So that's why this is not, like, this is not finished. This is, th this is, um, this is going to be problematic. So what we're going to do is we're going to find some faces on this model that we can extrude out to start getting the shape of this 
um, handle, right? And so you'll notice that from where um, we were in low res earlier, that's kind of how I'd set up these edges was to line up with that, right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to grab the two faces that would, that would be um, where that handle comes from. And I'll probably start at the top here. So if I just go to face mode, I can kind of drag and select those two. If I go back to perspective, you'll see it's, it's those two faces, right? Um, you can also find it if, you're, if you still have your grid on. Usually it's the two faces that are um, sort of on either side of that thickest line right there on, on your grid. Now, if you track that all the way up, you'll see it's those two, right? So, we've already saw how to use that extrude button, right? Control E, move it a little, Control E, move it a little, Control E, move it a little. The problem with that is, is that's a lot of movement to try to build up a larger shape. Um, and so, my way of modeling things is I try to get the simplest possible version of that model first, and then I add more detail to get, uh, or add more edge loops or more uh, topology to get that detail in there, right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to make that handle out of two extrudes, and it's going to look terrible. But then I'm going to insert edge loops to make it look right. So I'm basically just going to extrude out and then like down and then like back into the cup, right? So we can get it in two or three pretty simple ones just to kind of get that mesh there. And then we can add more detail by inserting edge loops. So control E. Um, now this is the, this is the extrude tool. And you'll notice that if I can use this blue handle to extrude, but as I do, it starts getting wider. And that's because it's extruding it out in the direction of that the face is facing. If I just hit W, it'll allow me to pull it straight forward. And so it doesn't get wider. So after I extrude, I just move it. Right? Now, I'm trying to get this to wrap back around and connect into here. I can do this in two to three extrusions. Um, easiest, I could do it in two. I can move this down and sort of rotate it, something like this. Right. Maybe move this out a little bit more like this. Right. And so I'm just rotating those faces. And then if I hit Control E again, and W, I can extrude that down, back over. And so that's kind of the simplest version of that handle that I can make. Um, you can maybe get it sort of around like that in two or three extrusions or four or five, however many you want. But you probably shouldn't do it in like 30, right? We're, we're trying to do this simply. That way we can let Maya do some of the heavy lifting for us. Anybody need me to do that again? Yes. Okay. This part always is a little confusing. So I'm going to hit Control-Z a few times. Okay. Yes. Great. Just do it the way that I did it. Like, if you 
realize what happens is like you have that hard angle now, you have a 90 degree angle. And so trying to get it without making that 90 degree angle. Insert more edges just to kind of mesh tools into it. handle thing one more time so you can see like what I did because it's pretty confusing that basically what I'm doing is I'm <coughs> rotating and moving those faces after we extrude it right okay. so I hit control E and we're in extrude mode right and then I can just use the move rotate and scale tools to to move these new faces around they're gonna stay connected to the previous one right okay. so I can move that down but they're still facing away from the cup so all I did was just rotate them in um, this axis to get them kind of aiming back toward the cup a little bit, right? Too fast? So now if I do it again, if I extrude again, I can do the same thing. And really what I'm trying to do is get my handle back over here to where these two faces are pointing at these two faces. I try to do it in as few steps as possible, um, mainly just because then after I get these connected, I can start refining that shape that makes the handle, right? Yes? So some of that is just being careful when you extrude to um, 
Now, something I will, uh, I'll tell you, um, your first coffee cup isn't going to be your best coffee cup, right? <laughs> and, that's, and that's okay. Um, that's true in real pottery too, probably. Um, so, like, if this, if what you're doing today in class is just finding out the steps not to do, um, then that just means that when you, when you, make this cup later, it, it'll go way faster, right? Now, here comes the hard part. I have these, this handle that's extruded out of the top. How do I connect that into the bottom? And that's confusing. <coughs> what this requires us to do is to think about this model a little differently, right? So we can look at this and it feels like an object. It feels like a tangible thing you can pick up and move around, right? But it's not. It's more like a balloon, right? It's a, it's a, it's a face that gives the impression that this thing actually has volume, right? But that's not full of ceramic. In fact, if I tumbled around here to the top of this object, we could, we could kind of go inside it and see that it's hollow in there, right? Um, and so what we're really creating is a, um, a series of faces that look like that object that would have volume inside of it. But like, it would be wasteful for the computer to be calculating all of that mesh on the inside of the coffee cup, uh, like in, the, in the, the part of the ceramic, right, that we'll never see. So really it's just making the surface that we can see. Which means, if I delete these two faces right here, right, if I just hit delete, you'll be able to see up into that handle, right? And the same over here on this. If I, if I just select these two faces and hit delete, we'll be able to see into that part of the mesh, right? But now what I have is I have the ability to select these two edges and sort of weld those together. So we can start making this all one watertight shape. So I'm going to show you a whole bunch of new modeling tools, but we're not going to go through all of them today. I'm just going to show you where they live and um, how to use them. So if you look up here in the top corner, you'll see that little white like, box with a hammer next to it. That's the modeling toolkit. And if I hit that button, It'll open this up down the side here. And these are just a whole bunch of different modeling tools that we can use um, to create models. Um, a couple of them I'll point out to you here. We have Booleans, we have Combine, we have Extrude, Bevel, um, Bridge. Right? All of these are different tools that if you're enjoying modeling, you should get familiar with. I'm going to share another video when I share this one which is me basically just going through really quickly and showing you 10 different modeling tools, actually maybe 11 different modeling tools, right? Um, that is nowhere near all of the modeling tools that exist. Um, so modeling is really just using some tools, some pretty simple tools to manipulate this mesh and get the, the form that you want. The tool we're gonna use though is this right here, this target weld, see that? Now, um, you can find Target Weld in another place as well. It's under Mesh Tools, and it's all the way at the bottom here. Um, so there's all these different modeling tools, but Mesh Tools, that's a whole bunch of different tools. Um, Edit Mesh has some other tools in it. Mesh has some other modeling tools in it. Like, all of these things are different ways that we can manipulate this mesh to get a better result, right? So again, if I click on this Target Weld, I want you to look what happens. As I'm, one, my, my, uh, my locator is different. My, my mouse uh, icon is different, right? It's like a little crosshair, see it there? Yeah. And you'll notice that as I mouse over something, it'll highlight it, right? So if I mouse over this edge, it highlights it. But if I go to the other part of this here, if I go to the, uh, it's not doing it. Anyway, this edge will work. Um, if multi-component is turned on, you'll also see that if I mouse over like the corner, that vertex is highlighted, right? So any of this will work, but as I mouse over this edge, it highlights it. 
And if I click on that and drag, it'll allow me to weld it to a different edge. So when I release here, it will weld those two edges together. Okay, And that's what I'm going to do just to get my coffee cup as one piece. I'm going to weld all of these edges together. Or maybe even, you can do it as vertex too if you'd rather. So, right? Now once I've done that, if I hit three, look what I get. Isn't it beautiful? Um, but the thing I do want you to notice is that's all one piece, right? All of that mesh is one piece. Now, yes? Uh, bridging the edges would, it would have the same effect, but what it would do is it would put another face in between them instead of welding them <laughs> together, right? Okay. Uh, bridging is like, I have this edge here, I have this edge here, connect those two edges with a face, right? Okay. So it would just sort of, it would bridge that gap with another face. Right. Uh, so yeah, you could, you could do it that way as well. So I know that this is ugly when I hit three now, but that's okay. The hard part of connecting them is done. Now I got to do is just insert edge loops and move this stuff around to get the shape that I want, right? And so I can go to my front view here. Uh, yes? How did I do it? Uh, let me go back a little bit and show you here. Control Z. There we go. Um, so if I have multi-component turned on here, it'll work best. Um, but if you mouse over one component, like you see how that's a vertex there and it highlights it, if I click on it, it will sort of keep a little circle around it. And as I move toward another component, it'll be like, which one do you want to weld it to? Right? Um, I want to weld it to that one. And I can just sort of go through here one at a time and do that either with edges or with um, vertices. Right? So I can also do like this face, or this edge to this edge, right? and then this edge to this edge. And so it's just going to weld it all together until it's one piece. And again, if I hit three, does that's smooth. Maybe, uh, does it make a difference if you do one at a time, or if you do like angles with the color Yeah, no, as, as long as they're all together, and then when you hit three, you can see that it's kind of one piece. Then, then you're okay. So once I have this though, it really is still missing some information, right? And that's okay because it's really easy to add additional edge loops. I just insert a new edge loop, right? So what I'm going to do is from the front view, I'm going to start manipulating this, uh, these vertices until I get um, my model in the place that I want it to be, right? So that's not bad. Um, go back to one here. It's probably a little too far. Let's get maybe something like that. Um, four, right. So I'm just trying to be as clean as possible. So maybe like that. Right. Um, but again, it's this triangle angle. So all I need for more definition there is just another edge loop. So if I go to Mesh Tools, Insert Edge Loop, I can put one there, and then once I have that edge loop, I can move it up and start refining the shape. Okay, um, actually G, the letter G will repeat the previous tool, or I can click it right here as well on the side. So if I hit G, I can insert another edge loop, and I can just slowly start building this handle. Right, and so when I hit three, you'll start to see that it's looking closer and closer. Um, now there are certain areas where it maybe needs a little bit more definition just to retain the shape. So an example of that is look how much this smooths in between here, like uh, between where the handle is. So it kind of does that. Like maybe what I need is um, another edge loop here and here. It's going to kind of start holding that shape a little bit. Um, yeah, so I can just keep adding edge loops until, um, until I get the shape that I want. Now, 
the other thing I noticed is that my, my coffee cup handle is kind of wide. So you could go like to the top view or something like that and select a bunch of these vertices and maybe scale them inward a little bit if you want to. Something like this. Perspective six. There we go. Okay, I know I kind of sped through that last little bit there, but um, just kind of keep fighting around with it, and eventually you will get whatever form you want, right? Okay. Um, this is, I, I'm going to share a couple of videos with you, but I, I want to explain like that this is really um, how 90% of what we call box modeling works, right? Now, there's another kind of modeling, um, which is called sculpting. How many of you have played around with something like ZBrush or Mudbox? Anybody played with any of that? Right. So there's some sculpting tools in Maya. I'll be honest, in this case, they're not super helpful. Um, like, they're really good in, in stuff like uh, sculpting terrain or something. But I'm going to show you a couple of more modeling tools and then very, very quickly, I'm going to model a cereal box, okay? Um, these are mainly just so you kind of know that these tools exist. Um, but then after that, I'll give you the, uh, the write-up for the assignment, and, uh, and we'll, we'll kind of kick that off from there and, and move forward. So, um, so the sculpting tools are really kind of neat. I'm just going to go ahead and uh, hide this model, Control-H to hide it. Um, and I'm going to create a polygon or a plane here. Now, we saw earlier that if I grabbed a vertex, right, and moved that one vertex, it's going to do something like that, right? But if I hit B, we're going to get that soft select, right? And I can hold down B and make that shape bigger. And then, I, again, I still just have that one vertex selected. But all that area around it will fall off, right? It'll kind of get this, like, progressive drag on that, right? So sculpting tools are kind of like that. Th this is just the soft select tool. But sculpting tools are going to allow us to get these, like, softer organic shapes faster. But the problem with that is soft organic shapes usually require more detail in the mesh for that to work, right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to undo this and hit B, go back to my object mode, right? Um, so right here, this next tab over says sculpting. So I want you to look at all of these tools. Has anybody tried clicking on any of these and, and using them before? Did it explode? Yes. Do some crazy stuff? So if I click on this first one, it's just the sculpt tool, right? It's going to lift the surface, right? And it looks like I just have a little dot there, but when I click and drag with that little dot, oh, it kind of resized. I don't know what just happened there. Um, it's going to allow me to start, like, painting and, like, getting this shape to deform. The problem with this is it's just still a really low res um, uh, size. Now, sometimes when you first click on here, um, your sculpting tool is enormous, right? It's, like, way out here. And when you go and click, it just looks like it lifts your object up. Really what's happening is it's, it's sculpting it, but it's really little bits at a time, right? Um, so all of these tools, all these sculpting tools, we can manipulate them just by going to this little option right here, the tool settings. It's the, uh, the hammer with the three dots beside it. So if we click that, you'll see that we have all of our sculpting tool information here. We can change our brush size here. And make it something down here kind of reasonable. Uh, oh. um, yeah, there we go. Um, and we can also change the strength, right? We can make this um, bigger as well. So when I paint, it's going to make it a little bit bigger. But what we're not getting is actually anything that looks good because this model doesn't have enough resolution to it. So if I go to my channel box and I make this polygon plane something that has more detail, instead of 10 by 10, let's do 100 by 100, right? 
So now when I go in here and start to sculpt this object, so that's a little high. I'm going to turn my strength down a little bit. We're going to be able to sculpt like this. Okay. Um, again, I can hold B, make my brush a little bit bigger, and start to sculpt. And this is how a lot of organic modeling is done. Um, I'm showing you this inside of Maya, um, but most modeling is, most sculpting is either done in ZBrush or Mudbox. There's just some simple sculpting tools inside of Maya that will allow us to get some of this stuff as well. Each of those sculpting tools along the top will do something different. Um, if I click, let's see what this one is. This is the smooth tool. It will sort of soften this out a little bit. Um, let's click this one here. This is the grab tool. And it just allows me to grab points and kind of pull them up a little bit. Just nudge it around in whatever axis I want. All right. Um, this is the uh, pinch tool. So what that will allow us to do is um, sort of pinch corners together. So if I wanted this little section here to be a little tighter, I can sort of pinch that, and it's going to sort of pinch it in, right? It's going to sort of... Um, one of the ones I like is this one right here. It's the, uh, the knife tool. And what that will allow me to do is actually start cutting into this object, right? To start cutting a seam through it. So resize my brush a little smaller, and you'll see that I can start cutting these, like, grooves through it. And then, again, I can hold shift and kind of smooth that out a little bit. Um, so I feel like there have been other times in this class where I, I could have shown you the sculpting tool, but stuff was probably a little overwhelming at that time um, on the project itself. So I thought this was a good point to kind of layer it in there, right? Um, sculpting will allow us to go in here and, like, carve all sorts of detail, but only up to the level that there is detail on this model. Maya can't really handle extremely high-res models, and that's one of the reasons ZBrush and Mudbox exist, is because they can. And so you can have a character model that literally has like 10 billion faces on or 10 million faces on it, and you can carve in stuff like the pores on your skin, right? Now, that's useless when you bring it back to Maya, though, because Maya is never going to be able to deform that. And what we can do is we can bake that detail information onto a lower res model as a normal or a bump map. So we'll talk a little bit more about maps um, a little bit later. So um, this is something that, like, this is just another modeling tool you may find handy. Um, but if you're interested in doing character models or organic models, this is the vast majority of um, the way that those are made, right? is with, with sculpting. Um, you'll learn more about that in the modeling for entertainment class, but if you're interested in this, I can show you some, some workflow stuff in here too. Um, I just, I don't want to, there's not really an opportunity in any of the projects to, to utilize this too much. So the last thing I wanted to do is show you really quickly on why um, we're going to model a cereal box the way we are. So I'm going to show you really quickly how to model this cereal box, right? Um, because what a lot of people want to do is um, just do something like this, right? And then grab this top face and delete it, right? Yay, we're done with our cereal box, right? And a cereal box is one of those objects that seems like it's thin enough for this to work. Um, the problem with this is, is if I put a texture on this, that texture will be both on the outside and the inside, right? Um, and just like, you know, if you buy a box of cereal, they're not going to waste ink to print on the inside of the box. It's, it's that bare cardboard on the inside and the color on the outside. So, um, so the way we would actually do this is very similar to our coffee cup, right? Um, I'm going to go ahead and make my object a little wider. I'll grab this face on the top and hit control E. And I'm going to scale this in just a little bitty bit just to get this lip on the edge there and on this edge over here, right? And then after that, I'm going to hit control E again and just push that down into the box. 
that is most of the modeling um, for this cereal box. I'll get it down there kind of close to the bottom. Um, the last thing I would do is I would go ahead and grab this little bitty face on the top. Uh, I'm sorry. Face there. Maybe grab this one over here on this other side as well. And we'll go ahead and extrude it as well. Just kind of pull those up so we get these lips right, for the flap. And then the same thing here with these two. Uh, nope. Control E. Oh, apparently I missed that one. And then after we got those flaps, we can kind of move those around to, to make this make sense, right? Maybe something like that. Um, actually, I could even rotate that a little bit if I wanted to. And so, the difference with a cereal box and um, our coffee cup is that we, um, we're probably not going to smooth our cereal box, right? Because if we do, we get that, and that is not a good cereal box. Um, so I wanted to show you that because I, I want you all to come in with some variation of a cereal box and a bowl tomorrow or next class period. Um, I know I've, I've tossed a lot out there. Like this is a lot of modeling stuff. Um, and again, like just knowing that these buttons exist isn't how you learn this stuff. It's fighting with it until you can use the tool correctly, right? Um, you can read the driver's handbook all you want to. There's a reason they make you take a driving test before they give you a license. So what you're going to do is, is practice with some of these over the, the rest of the class. Um, I'm going to go ahead and post the full um, project, uh, breakfast project in band, so you can see what we're, what we're getting into. And then if you'd like, I'll show you some examples from some previous classes as well. Um, so let me go ahead and get band up here. Um, share, copy link, yeah, log into Facebook, whatever. Okay. PR3 breakfast post. Okay, so let's look at this together um, 150 so why are we doing this um, so we're going to explore some more complex models more effects and more rigging and animation okay, that's that's the biggest thing but the animation we're going to be exploring is simulation animation so we'll get into that a little bit later we're not going to animate every one of those pieces of cereal falling out of that box we're going to use some effects to make it happen um, so what we're going to do You'll need to model a breakfast at a table. So every person um, for this project has to have at least seven objects in their scene. Um, a coffee cup. So I have a YouTube link to me modeling a coffee cup in a different video. A fully textured open box of cereal. Um, you can either use an existing type of cereal or one of your own design. I will tell you right now that for simulation purposes, round cereal works better. Cheerios, uh, yeah, they're delicious and all, but simulating that means there's going to be, it, it's got a couple of extra steps. So I would encourage you to pick a cereal that is believably round. Um, Cocoa Puffs, everybody loves Cocoa Puffs, right? Um, what was that? Did you just cringe at Cocoa Puffs? If you can come up with other simply shaped objects, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> my, my wife loves Honey Nut Cheerios. Yeah, that's, but, honey Bunches of Oats. Honey Bunches of Oats. I don't know. I, I would say th think in terms of kids' cereal a little bit more just because. <laughs> 
What's going to happen is we're going to be animating these, these pieces falling out, and it's a lot easier if we don't have to consider how they rotate. So if they're round, it simulates a little easier. But if you're like dead set and you're like, nope, got to be Cheerios, like that's cool. I, 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 can, I can make it work. I would totally avoid anything flake based. Um, and I love raisin bran, so like, I, I, but like that's the that, still it's going to be a little easier. Um, now I am also giving you the option to completely invent a cereal, um, which means you would have to, as part of the texturing process, you'll have to design a cereal box. Um, if you're, this is a chance to maybe do some overlap with some of your previous classes. Uh, I know um, so, some of the visualization classes you have to design a character, right? Do you want your character to be on your cereal box? Is, or um, some of you do a comic book character. Maybe it's the, you know, whatever uh, your character is on this box. Um, we're going to do a little bit of designing in that, but I, I'm not going to um, I'm not going to force you to do that. That's just a fun little extra if you wanted to do that. So um, you'll also need to model a bowl and a spoon, because otherwise how are you going to eat your cereal? Um, and your choice of two objects from the list below. Um, now, this last piece here um, can either be a third stationary object or as a bonus, like it's not sort of factored into the grading, I'll give you a bonus if you pick one of these objects and rig it and animate it in the same way that we did the model. All right, so bringing one of those pieces to life. Um, I just give you... Oh. Okay. I <laughs> did. Uh, All right. So let's look at the list of objects. I've picked a variety of breakfast foods. Recognize that the breakfast foods I picked were very like, um, like, like classic Americana breakfast, not, and, and if you're like, that's not what I eat for breakfast, or that's not, like, I want to do something that, uh, I don't know, maybe, uh, maybe you, um, <laughs> yeah, um, like, whatever it is you eat, like, if there's a slice of pizza on there, so I made this list of different things that you could have in there, um, if it's a glass of wine, you have a problem, um, <laughs> but, any of this stuff is acceptable. However, if, if you have something on there that you really want to add that's not on the list, look at these objects. This is more of the scope of what I want you to be able to model. So if you're like, oh yeah, what I want to model is um, this classic butter dish my grandma has that has a dragon fighting a knight on top of it, I'd be like, uh, where did she get that butter dish? Because that thing sounds awesome, but no, don't choose that one to model it. Now I really want that butter dish. Um, <laughs> so, so here's a bunch of different things you can do. Um, two of them are just extra items for the table. Um, the other one is if you want some extra credit, I think it's like five extra points on it, it's sort of bring it to life. So in the past, somebody had like a, a banana jumping around in the scene or something like that, right? Um, you could also make it that, like I think one person had their, um, uh, their cereal box like, blast off through the window and stuff like that, right? So it can be one of the objects that exist. Basically, if you choose to bring one of these to life, like rig it and bring it to life, um, I'll pack on five extra points just for, just for uh, the effort, basically. Um, okay, so you're going to model all these things, this breakfast scene. We're going to texture it, light it, animate it, and render it. And the animation should be between 7 to 10 seconds. Um, I would encourage you to not model an entire kitchen or dining room scene, right? If, I, I, if, if you're just really enjoying modeling and you want to go nuts on that and you're getting everything else done as well, sure, have at it, but that is not required. And, and a lot of people, like, it starts to grow. They're like, okay, I got my table here. Um, I, I, it needs a chair, though. Oh, it's got a chair. Now it needs a kitchen floor. Oh, it's got a kitchen floor. Now it needs a countertop. Oh, it's got a countertop. Now it needs grass outside. Now it needs a cityscape in the distance. And before you know it, you've modeled a thousand things, but you haven't textured or animated anything, right? And 
so like kind of keep it within balance. One of the ways of doing that is some very focused lighting on the table to where you don't really notice the environment very much. But, um, yeah, you can do that, or we, we can just play around with like the environment lights. I think some of the uh, uh, IVL, uh, the HDRI images are um, are an interior anyway, so we could use something like that. So basically, um, we're going to render this, and it'll be due at the uh, beginning of class on April nineteenth. Um, so I'm going to walk you through over the next couple classes. I'm going to walk you through the um, simulation of the serial and the simulation of some steam and then you're just going to render that and uh, turn in the final render so um, don't worry about that part too much just yet right now worry about getting some models but in the next class period um, on Monday I'm sorry on Wednesday um, you're gonna at least need that serial box and a bowl so I would I would sort of focus in on getting those two things modeled um, and I'm also going to show you some uh, UV stuff uh, with a cereal box. So, um, you all want to see some examples of some previous ones? Yes. No. <laughs> um, let's see what we can find here. Um, you're always welcome to browse these folders. Um, under faculty, Greg... This old folder right here has some of my previous classes in it. It's not all of them, but some of them. And so you can always go back through some of these old folders to see what people did. So summer 2017, I'm sorry, spring 2017. Uh, so this would have been a year ago, I guess, right? Um, so turn in and breakfast. Let me find a good one here. Um, here we go. So, this one's okay. Uh, the serial simulation is good. The steam is maybe a little thin. Um, maybe not the world's best texture on the, the model, but not, not bad. So you're getting the idea of sort of the scope. Catherine Hargis always does great work. Um, so she had some simulation issues. She actually turned in a revision later. Um, yeah, there it is. That's what it looks like after it pulls out. And then she did the adorable little banana thing here. Is it a dolphin or bird? It's a dolphin banana. Dolphinana. Um, let's see. Of course, Lisa, if you know Lisa, always goes over the top. Um, this is this is the top end of the spectrum here. Um, if if you know if if this is a. Yeah, so uh, she she does some she does some great work and she really pushed it. Like actually, the that coffee cup is pretty impressive. Yeah, the banana is a little boxy. Like it's yeah, I know. I, she 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 goes big on everything. Um, and I think another uh, good example is is Ethan in here. You see Ethan El uh, Elkins? Yeah, there he is. Oh, wrong one. Very cool. I'm not sure I understand any of the jokes at all on this one, but he always kind of. Uh, <laughs> I get the Daft Punk thing, but otherwise I'm not sure I get all of it. But he really like kind of. Put... Yeah, yeah. Um. So feel free to like go through these and get some ideas uh, from other people. Um, Jeremiah always does pretty good stuff here. So this is kind of a example of it. You'll see some of the issues. You see how none of the cereal is really rotating? I don't like that. Um, how all the cereal kind of seems like it's in the same uh, orientation. That's that's what happens when we when we model like a... That's one of the reasons to use the, the spherical uh, cereal. Because then you won't really notice that it's it's all sort of in the same direction. Is there any way to get it to rotate? There is. Because um, actually Lisa, you'll see that she has it on hers. It's just a little hard to get it looking right you, you it's pretty much just a couple of extra steps you kind of have to fight with um but i can help you make that if that's something you're wanting to do because even in hers you'll still see a lot of them are kind of in the same uh angle is it possible to like once it's simulated to change them individually um yeah 
So there's there's a couple of other things. There's there's more than one way of doing this, um, just like everything in Maya. There is another way of doing it with something called um, uh, Bullet, which is a it's a it's a rigid body physics simulator. The way you would do that is you would model your what we're going to do is we're going to model one piece of cereal, and then we're going to use particles to emit that cereal out of the cereal box. Um, one of the other options is to model thousands of pieces of cereal and simulate them as if they're all individual objects. So that way we'll get you a good result too. It'll just bog your computer down a little bit more. So, it, like again, if, if there's a specific cereal you're wanting to go with, that's fine with me. Just know that you're kind of biting off a little bit extra on that. Not like ridiculous enough. Lucky, uh, Lucky Charms. Uh, yeah, sure. I, I'll, I'll let you like go as big as you want to, but recognize it makes it harder every time you do. I would just get it. That would be a hard thing to do, right? Yeah. Because you have to do like marshmallows and all of your and it's just shaking out like those weird triangles and stuff and make the highlights really. And recognize that by doing that, like you're you're also it's not you're making it harder, but you're also um, you're kind of slowing down Maya a little bit. So because it has to simulate all that stuff. So you can go back to some of the other classes and see some of their examples as well. Um, there was a point at which this project changed a little bit. Um, and so, actually, this is last semester's. I'm trying to remember, who, has, who had a really good one here? Um, at one point, I, I had a different project, too. Um, the one that you, you all did with the bottle, it was a different project. So um, I sort of dropped that one and then put some of the things from it into here. I can't remember. I can't remember which ones were good and which ones were. So I think Sarah's of Sarah's eventually was good. She didn't. She didn't have it finished in this one. Um, actually, yeah. Let's go back to her Dropbox. Her revision of this one. Um, was really kind of good. It's a little dark. I always get some variation of a like post-apocalyptic breakfast, um, and that's that's always kind of cool too. So, um, yeah. So feel free to go through these, look at some of them, see what what people got out of it. Um, actually, yeah, I think Matt's stuff was pretty good. Spencer, oh, he has a version later that got better. All right. Um, all right, cool. So feel free to go through these, check some of them out. Um, anybody have any questions about any of this? So what's due is the cereal box is a bowl. Yeah, so it's not necessarily I'm going to be like checking that off and grading it next class period, but that's what we're going to start working with in next class period. So just so you can kind of work along, that's what, yeah, having a cereal box and a bowl. And if your cereal is a different shape other than a sphere, you may want to spend a little bit of time you know, fixing that. So, yeah. All right, cool. Um, I know it's actually, we're pretty much out of time. I think this class ends at, is this it, 4.45? Yeah. yeah, so we've got two whole minutes. Updates are available. Um, okay, cool. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll be around. I'm going to go ahead and kill this, um, kill this capture and upload it to YouTube uh, so you all have that here in a minute. So. Uh, I should. Uh,